أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين رب شحلي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي. In our last lesson, we mentioned several points regarding the hereafter. Number one, we mentioned the importance of studying the Quranic verses and the narrations that speak about the hereafter in order to know what to expect when we leave to that world and in order to prepare for that world such that when the time comes and we have to leave we leave to the abode of peace not to the abode of punishment we leave to the abode of comfort not to the abode of misery we also mentioned that the intellect does have the ability to confirm the existence of a hereafter the intellect does have the ability to confirm the existence of life after death. And we mentioned two logical proofs, two logical proofs um, that lead us to this conclusion. One of those proofs pertain to what pertain to the oppression we see or we saw in this world. This one was a logical proof. We did not use any Quranic verses or any narrations um, in order to confirm the existence of the hereafter. And the second proof pertained to what? To the rewards of the believers and the punishments of the disbelievers. This one was a mixture of what? Of a logical proof with a textual proof. So in short, we said that uh, the intellect does have the ability to confirm the existence of a hereafter, of life after death. However, most details regarding the stages of the hereafter cannot be uh, detected or, say, determined by the intellect. Thus, the intellect will tell you what? Use the verses of the Qur'an and or the narrations of Ahlul Bayt والسلام, to confirm these details for example the intellect on its own cannot be certain that there is an angel of death an angel that comes forth and pulls your soul at the time of death out of your body of course but the quran confirms the presence of the angel of death and the narrations of ahlul bayt do so as well so the intellect tells you what? It tells you you have to believe in the angel of death. Why? Because the Quran said so. And I, the intellect is speaking, I've proven that Allah Ta'ala exists, that Allah Jalla Jalalu uh, is all wise, he's all knowledgeable, all powerful, he's all just, so on to, so forth. I've confirmed multiple attributes of God, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I've also confirmed Again, the intellect is speaking that Muhammad is a prophet, وآله, that he is infallible, and that Ahlul Bayt are the successors and the Imams after Muhammad, وسلم, and that they're infallible. So I obligate you, O human being, to believe in the words of the Quran and the words of Ahlul Bayt. Thus, when the Quran and Ahlul Bayt give us plenty of details, Oceans of verses or narrations that speak about the details, the itsy bitsy details of the hereafter, we have to accept these details. The intellect obligates us to do so. The intellect on its own cannot determine, for example, what will take place when the body of the human being is buried. But the narrations can, and the narrations have determined what happens. They've told us. Ahlul Bayt have told us that the grave turns into a garden from the gardens of heaven 
or into a pit from the pits of hellfire. The intellect cannot be certain on its own that on the day of judgment there will be a lot of chaos and that people will be, you know, afraid, scared, running from, uh, running away from each other, such that the human will run away from his brother and mother and father and wife and children. Each one will be preoccupied with his or own or her own affair. Of course, we're talking on what? On a general level. We're not talking about every single person. But generally, this will be the state of human beings. Quran says so. Where? In Surah Abasa. When Allah says, يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ أَخِيهِ وَأُمِّهِ وَأَبِيهِ وَصَاحِبَتِهِ وَبَنِيهِ لِكُلِّ مْرِئٍ مِّنْهُمْ يَوْمَ إِذٍ شَأْنٌ يُغْنِيهِ So in short, we said most of the details regarding the hereafter are uh, de determined and confirmed by what? By the Quran and by the narrations of Ahlul Bayt alayhim as salat was salam. We human beings are in deep need of Ahlul Bayt, especially when it comes to the hereafter. Why? Because the hereafter is part of the world of the unseen. It's a world that we do not know. We don't know the laws of that world, nor do we know the occurrences of that world, had it not been for Ahlul Bayt, salawatullah alayhim. Thus, we need to listen to them. The Imams who were given the knowledge of the unseen, with God's permission, of course, we need to listen to them in order to know what can we do from now to prepare for that world. Because ultimately, whatever we're going to witness in the hereafter is a reflection of what? Of our belief right now and our deeds, our practices. It's a reflection of your beliefs and your deeds. Let me start the lesson today by giving you an example pertaining to the month of Rajab. The month of Rajab and the deeds that we perform in this month have a direct effect on our hereafter. A direct effect. How do we know this? Had it not been for Ahlul Bayt, we wouldn't know. But they're the ones who told us. والسلام, so we're very fortunate to have Ahlul Bayt in our lives. The month of Rajab, the month of Shaban, the month of Ramadan, these holy months have outstanding effects, meaning the deeds that you do in these holy months have outstanding effects on what? On your hereafter. I'll give you one example, and that is a narration found in the book Fadail al Ashur al Thalatha, Fadail al Ashur al Thalatha, for Sheikh al Saduq rahmatullah. It's a book that basically mentions plenty of traditions from Ahlul Bayt about the importance of Rajab, Shaban, and the month of Ramadan. I sent you the tradition on the chat section. Sheikh Saduq Rahmatullah mentions his chain of narrators that goes back to Sufyan al Thawri. Who says that Imam al Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam said that his father, Imam al Baqir, said that his father, Imam al Sajjad, said that his father, Al Hussein bin Ali alayhi salam, said that his brother, Al Hassan, said that his father, Ali bin Abi Talib, salawatullah alayhim, said. What did he say? Man sama yawman min rajab fi awwalih, aw fi wasatih, aw fi akhirih. غفر له ما تقدم ما تقدم من ذنبه وما تأخر. I believe there's a missing word here, which is min. It should be ما تقدم من ذنبه, not ما تقدم ذنبه. ما تقدم من ذنبه وما تأخر. The Imam is saying what? He's saying he who fasts one day of Rajab, whether that day 
is from the first part of Rajab or the second part of Rajab or the third part of Rajab. All of his sins, the sins of that individual, will be forgiven. His first sins and his last. Here we have a few points to make. Number one, the Imam is telling you, Salawatullah, that if you fast one day of Rajab, whether that day is part of the first 10 days of Rajab, the second 10 days, or the last 10 days of Rajab, it won't make a difference. You will be forgiven for all of what? All of your sins. This is the first point. The second point is, he says, ما تقدم من ذنبه وما تأخر. His first and last sins will be forgiven. What is meant by this statement? We've mentioned this before, if you remember, but we'll repeat to remind ourselves of this important reality. At the end of the day, the goals behind these classes, the lectures, the majalis we give, etc., is what? Learning something new and also reminding ourselves of what we already know. The reminder is as important as the piece of information that you learn meaning the piece of information, the unknown piece of information that you learn. Both are important, and the reminder is not any less important. Thus, al Quran al Karim tells the Prophet ﷺ that he has two roles. One role is to teach, meaning to teach people what they don't know. Allah says, يُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ He teaches them the book and wisdom. Or he teaches them, according to a second interpretation, he teaches them how to write. Well, hikmah and wisdom. But then again, Quran says what? Innama anta mudakkir. You are solely one who reminds people, Ya Rasulullah. Lasta alayhim bi musaytir. You are not in control of their deeds. Meaning, Ya Rasulullah, you can't force people to obey Allah Ta'ala. But yes, you can remind them. So remind them of the truth, remind them of the hereafter, remind them of God's obedience, etc. So he had two main rules, teaching what people do not know, and also reminding them of what they know. So what is meant by ما تقدم من ذنبه وما تأخر? His first and last sins will be forgiven. Here we have two interpretations, or say two possibilities. Number one, what is man is that all of his past sins will be forgiven, whether those sins were committed recently or not. Whether the sin was committed recently, such as a sin that was committed a few hours ago or a few days ago, or not, it was not committed recently, it was committed uh, a long time ago. For example, it was committed 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. So basically the hadith is saying, based on the first interpretation, that all of the past sins will be forgiven. Khosh. Khosh, by the way, means good in Iraqi. What about the second interpretation? The second interpretation says, مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِهِ وَمَا تَأَخَّارِ his first and last sins means his past sins, those are his first sins, and the sins he will commit in the future, those are the last sins. Based on this interpretation, the Imam is saying if one fasts a day from Rajab, he will be granted ultimate forgiveness. Forgiveness for the past sins and forgiveness for the sins he commits what in the future. Here, one might ask, isn't this misleading? Isn't this interpretation quite misleading? Because if we believe that fasting one day of Rajab is enough to cover all of our sins to 
to, you know, erase all of our sins, even if we commit sins in the future, then this will encourage people to sin. People will fast one day of Rajab, and then they'll sin day and night, promising themselves forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As they say, well, Imam Ali told us, salawatullah alayhi, that if we fast one day of Rajab, we'll be forgiven for all of our sins. Hence, we are allowed, we're given a green light to sin day and night. And at the end of the day, we'll be in heaven. Someone might pose that question. And the answer is, no, this hadith, even based on the second interpretation, is not misleading. Why? For the following points. Number one, whenever we read a tradition from Ahlul Bayt or even a Quranic verse, we need to understand the point behind this tradition or this verse. What's Allah's point? Or what is the Imam's point? We need to understand the gist, the essence of the verse and the tradition. Where does Allah want to lead us? Where does the Imam want to lead us? Imam Ali and the rest of the Imams والسلام, never have and never will give us a green light to sin. They've told us countless times, don't disobey God. Refraining from disobeying Allah Ta'ala is better than sinning and then repenting. Although if you repent, you will be forgiven. But refraining from the sin at start, from the start, is better. As they say, abstinence is better than cure, right? So, the point behind such a hadith isn't to tell people, go ahead, sin day and night. No, that's not the point. The point is to tell them, don't lose hope in Allah Ta'ala. Allah is a very merciful Lord. One good deed done in Rajab might save you in the hereafter. That's one point. Another point behind this hadith is to encourage us to do good deeds and to be pious. In fact, to maintain piety. That's the point behind the hadith. The point isn't to give us a green light to sin. So if we understand this, and we understand the following point, we'll know that this hadith is not misleading. What's the following point? The following, po following point is, when you commit a good deed, you need to preserve that good deed. Preserving it, Keeping it in your record is really important. If one commits a good deed and then gives himself the green light to misbehave and to do whatever he wants, possibly he'll lose that good deed. It's very likely he will lose it. It's very likely that his sins will do what? Will obliterate that deed. And as a result, he might exit this world as a disbeliever or a polytheist or a hypocrite which will lead him to what? To eternal, eternal damnation in the hereafter. So the good deed he had committed will be what? Will be obliterated. Will be gone. So when you do a good deed, it's really important to do what? To stay on guard, to maintain piety, to try as much as you can to be pious so that you preserve the good deed. One might tell me, so you're telling us if we sin once, that's it, the good deed is gone? That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying if we hold this mentality, which says, since I've fasted one month, sorry, one day of Rajab, or I've done a really good deed such as Ziyarat al-Imam al-Husayn alayhi salatu wasalam, then I'm guaranteed heaven, even if I sin day and night, if we, may, if we hold this mentality, this mentality might lead us to doom and it might lead us to what? To obliterating the good deed that we've done. Once you obliterate it, 
the good deed won't be present anymore in your record to save you in the hereafter. It won't be present anymore. You've demolished it. So it's really important to try as much as we can to maintain piety. There were people in the past who did have a good past, but they did not preserve the good past or the good deed done in the past. And as a result, their lives ended in a horrible manner. And when they left this world, they were on the evil side. So they lost. They lost what? They lost the rewards of heaven. They lost their chance of entering heaven and became from the dwellers of hellfire. An example of such people is Az-Zubair. Ibn al-Awwam, or al-Awwam, the cousin of Amir al-Mu'mineen, Zubair had done really good deeds in his life. Really good deeds. The man fought with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and defended the Prophet. Defending Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in a battle is one of the best deeds you could do. But he lost all of that. When he turned against Rasulullah, and he came to fight Rasulullah and was one of the three main leaders in the battle of Jamal who was fighting Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Yes, he wasn't fighting Muhammad bin Abdullah, but he was fighting who? The self of Rasulullah, Ali ibn Abi Talib. And that is tantamount to fighting Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. That is tantamount to fighting Rasulullah. The Prophet said it explicitly. He who fights Ali is fighting me. And so he died as an enemy of Ali. Alayhi. Thus he lost his chance of entering heaven. A very sad story. So the second interpretation of this word, ما تقدم من ذنبه ما تقدم من ذنبه وما تأخر isn't misleading. It is not misleading if we keep the points we mentioned in mind. Last but not least, last but not least, let me explain what could be the possible meaning of this uh, statement. As in, let me explain how fasting one day of Rajab might grant you ultimate forgiveness such that even if someone sins after he fasts, he sins, for example, in, you know, Muharram or Safar or Rabi al Awad, etc., he'll still be forgiven. As long as he does what? He doesn't give himself the green light to sin. So he sins accidentally. He's not intending on sinning, but due to a certain weakness, he falls into sin. How could the month of uh, fasting one day from the month of Rajab grant him forgiveness for even the future sins, the sins he commits in the future? Here's the answer. Every deed has an effect. Every deed has an effect. Good deeds have good effects. Bad deeds have bad effects. Fasting a day from the month of Rajab has a marvelous effect on the soul. It leaves a really beautiful or nice mark on the soul. As a result, if someone actually fasts one day of Rajab, naturally he should be at a state of purity such that if he sins accidentally after that day, he will repent quickly. And by repenting quickly, what will he be doing? He'll be removing the sin because we know Allah Ta'ala promised us, if you repent, I will forgive you. As long as, of course, the conditions of repentance are upheld. So in short, 
Possibly the Imam is telling us, Salawatullah ala, fasting one day from the month of Rajab is such a marvelous deed that it gives you uh, an amount of purity such that if you sin later on, you repent quickly. And by repenting quickly, what happens? You obliterate the sin. Case closed. So again, I stress on the point that the point behind this hadith isn't to give us a green light to sin. Nor is the point of other ahadith that are similar. You see, this is not the only hadith we have that promises, promises us forgiveness if we do this deed. We have plenty of other traditions regarding other deeds that promise us the same, like visiting some of the Imams, alayhim salatu wassalam, especially Imam al rida peace be upon him. Or certain salawat that we could do, certain prayers, so on and so forth. I believe someone had a question amongst you. My son and Safi, you had a question? Um, no, I had uh, when you said about um, what, what was it? What uh, what was his name? He ha he was doing good deeds, and then he what fought for the prophet, and then went against him. What was his name? Zubair. Zubair. Okay. Zubair ibn al Awam or ibn al Awam, the cousin of Rasulullah and Amir al Mu'minin, alayhi salatu wassalam, alayhi All right, let's continue with the tradition. The Imam says, Amir al Mu'min alayhi salam, Waman sama talata ta ayyamin min rajab fi awalih, wa talata ta ayyamin fi wasatih, wa talata ta ayyamin fi akhirih, gufira lahu ma taqaddama min dhanbih, wa ma taakhar. He says, And he who fasts three days from the first part of rajab, meaning the first ten days, three days from the first ten days. And three days from the second part of Rajab, meaning from the second ten days. And three days from the last part of Rajab, from the last ten days. He will also be granted forgiveness for all of his sins. The first and last sins. Here, another question comes to mind. Imam Ali is talking about someone who fasts how many days? Nine days from Rajab. Three days from the start of, from the first part of Rajab, three days from the second part, and three days from the last part of Rajab. So he's talking about someone who fasts nine days. Yet he promises that someone the same reward he promises to who? To the one who fasts one day from Rajab. So if this is the case, why would we trouble ourselves and fast nine days? If we're going to get the same reward, I mean, we'll take the easy way out, right? And we'll just fast one day. The answer is, if you want to take the easy way out, by all means, go ahead. At the end of the day, fasting the month of Rajab is not wajib. It's mustahab, it's recommended. But it has tremendous rewards. So if someone doesn't fast any day from this holy month, he will be losing a fortune of rewards in the hereafter. So the wise thing to do is to fast at least some of these uh, some of these uh, holy days. However, when Imam Ali alayhi salatu salam, when Imam Ali alayhi salatu salam promises the one who fasts nine days of Rajab the same reward, one who fasts one day of Rajab is promised. He is not telling you that if, if you fast nine days of Rajab, this will be the only reward you will be given. See, he's mentioning part of the reward. Because without doubt, when someone commits multiple good deeds, his reward will be what? Amplified. His status in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be will become greater. He will 
reach higher and higher levels of perfection in the eyes of God. So, even if we suppose that fasting nine days of Rajab will grant you the same reward fasting one day of Rajab will grant you, um, at the end of the day, when you're fasting nine days, you're doing more good deeds. So it's only logical to say, you will get something that the other person will not. Who is the other person? The one who only fasted one day of Rajab. You will get something that person will not. Because you've done more. You've done more actions. And we have traditions about this. We have traditions from Ahlul Bayt, salam Allah alayhim. Hopefully in the future we can analyze these traditions that mention this point. If someone works harder in this world and does more good deeds, definitely his position in heaven will be higher than those who did not work as hard. Those who, as we say, took it easy, you know, although all of them will be in heaven. But we can't forget that heaven is composed of what? Levels. Then the Imam says, وَمَنْ أَحْيَا لَيْلَةً مِنْ لَيَالِي رَجَبْ أَعْتَقَهُ اللَّهُ مِنَ النَّارِ وَقَبِلَ شَفَاعَتَهُ فِي سَبْعِينِ أَلْفِ رَجُلٍ مِنَ الْمُذْنِبِينَ الله أكبر he says, he who <clears throat> stays up in worship for one night in Rajab. <clears throat> Meaning he stays up in worship for the whole night, just as we do during the nights of destiny or during the 15th night of Shaban. If someone does this, Allah Ta'ala will save him from hellfire, number one, and will accept his intercession regarding 70,000 sinners. So this person will become an intercessor on the Day of Judgment, a shafa, And his shafa, his intercession will be wide, such that he'll, he'll be able to save 70,000 sinners. If you remember, we said previously that the believer with the lowest status on the Day of Judgment will be able to uh, intercede for 30 people according to one tradition and 40 people according to a second tradition. There's a big difference between interceding for 40 people and 70,000 people. See, worshipping Allah Ta'ala for one full night in Rajab gets you to that level where you can do shafa'a, intercession, for 70,000 sinners. One might tell me, you know, Hammam, we stay up during the nights of destiny and during the night of the 15th of Shaban. Uh, we might not have the stamina to stay up in worship during one of the nights of Rajab. So tell us about another deed we could do. Sure, no problem. If you don't want to stay up in worship during one of the nights of Rajab, that's fine. At the end of the day, this is almost a habit. It's not wajib. It is not wajib. Let's read the last part of the tradition as Imam Ali alayhi salatu wasalam, presents to us a simple deed. And again I say a simple deed that can lead us to unbelievable rewards on the Day of Judgment. As he says, وَمَنْ تَصَدَّقَ بِصَدَقَةٍ فِي رَجَبْ إِبْتِغَاءَ وَجْهِ اللَّهِ أكرمه الله يوم القيامة في الجنة من الثواب ما لا عين رأت ولا أذن سمعت ولا خطر على قلب بشر. The Imam says, and he who pays a sadaqa, meaning he pays an amount of charity during the month of Rajab for the sake of Allah. So he's doing it for who? For God. He's not doing it to show off. He is not doing it so people can say, you know what, Fulan paid Sadaqah. He doesn't care. He can care less what people say. He wants Allah Ta'ala. If someone pays an amount of charity during the month of Rajab, for Allah's sake, in order to please God, Allah Ta'ala will honor that person on the day of judgment and will grant him rewards in heaven. 
Ya Amir al Mu'minin, describe these rewards for us. He says, These rewards will be rewards that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined. What's beautiful about this part of the narration is that he's telling you paying an amount of charity will lead you there, will lead you to that faith. This amount could be a, a minimal amount. It doesn't have to be something big. Even if it's a dollar or two dollars or 50 cents. If you do it for the sake of Allah during this month, Allah Ta'ala will lead you to heaven and the hereafter and he will give you such rewards. He will honor you on that day, on the day of judgment. Alhamdulillah. Today we have the opportunity to, you know, um, pay different forms of sadaqah, different forms of charity. We have plenty of opportunities. You can, for example, support the orphans of Iraq through the Al Ain Foundation, which was established by Sayyid Al Sistani, Um You can send them. Uh, e-transfers and tell them exactly what you want them to do with this money for example you want it as sadaqah jariyah or you just want it uh, you, you want to use it to build homes or fix homes in iraq uh, or to uh, sustain the orphans you choose what you want to do with that amount of charity there is also a najafiya foundation I'm not sure if you've heard about it which was established by um Sheikh Bashir al-Najafi, one of the Maraja of Iraq, um, if you go to their website, if you Google and najafiya Foundation, um, you'll see that uh, they have uh, a lot of options. A lot of options. You can sponsor an orphan. You can, you know, give an orphan money so he can learn. Um, you can uh, send, for example money for qurbanis, sacrifices, etc. There are a lot of options. One of the most beautiful options I saw on that website is a sadaqa. It's called, uh, it's a program basically called a sadaqa a day. Or sorry, a dollar a day. A dollar a day. Where basically you, you send them <clears throat> $60 at the start of the month and you'll be paying $1 as sadaqah, one dollar as sadaqah every day and one dollar every night. Hence, it's sixty dollars. What's beautiful about this is when you pay sadaqah during the day, it protects you from the calamities of that day. And when you pay sadaqah during the night, it protects you from the calamities of that night. So, by paying sadaqah every day of the month, and every night of the month, you're basically granting yourself divine protection from calamities. Now, sometimes, even if you pay sadaqah, you do get afflicted with a certain hardship or a certain calamity, because at the end of the day, the life of the believer must be mixed with some sort of hardship even if it's minimal hardship. In such a case, there would be a blockage, a certain mana, a blockage, stopping the sadaqah from taking effect. But in general, when someone pays sadaqah, when someone pays an amount of charity, the natural effect of the sadaqah is what? Protection. It protects him from calamities. I just wanted to mention this. Because these two foundations, Al Ain and Al Najafiya Foundation, give us the opportunity or opportunities to pay sadaqah and to benefit in this world and the hereafter. Jai. Brother Ihsan, inshallah, I'll, I'll answer your question uh, after the, the class is done. Bi
Sister Sophie, you're asking, are both sadaqas for Iraq? Uh, Al Ain, yes. Al Ain supports the orphans of Iraq. Al Najafiya, it does support orphans in Iraq, but I'm not exactly sure if it's only for Iraq. I'm not sure. What I know is that it was, it was established by uh, Sheikh Bashir al Najafi, Hafidahullah, Damatullah. So realize from this tradition how Ahlul Bayt alayhim salatu wassalam inform us of certain deeds that could be done now in the month of Rajab and that these deeds have direct effect on what? On our hereafter. This is what I mean when I say we need Ahlul Bayt salamullah alayhim in order to know what we need to do now to benefit then, to benefit in the hereafter. That being said, we'll start with our first topic, our first topic in these stages of the hereafter classes. All of the words that we said today and in the previous class were just an introduction to this class. So we're going to start with the first topic, although we won't have enough time to conclude it today. And that is, what is death? What is death? The reason we're analyzing this topic is because ultimately the hereafter begins when? When you die, right? To be more precise, it begins when your current life is coming to an end. And your afterlife is what? The, the life in the hereafter is starting. What we call Sakarat al maut So the hereafter revolves around death. Thus, before we analyze any stage of the hereafter, let's understand what is death. What is death? Death is something that all intellectuals no. All human beings know. All human beings believe in. Right? All humans, whether they're Muslims or non-Muslims, believers or non-believers, admit that there is something called death and that one day every human being will have died. That's a reality that we know. It's hard to find a belief that all humans hold or all humans agree upon. When it comes to death, we're all in agreement. Whether we're atheists or theists, whether we believe in Abrahamic religions or we don't, whether we're Muslims or not, we're Shia or not, everyone knows one day we will die. So what is that? The Quran al-Kareem makes a bold statement. The Quran al-Kareem makes a bold statement saying death is not a form of inexistence. Rather, it's something, it's a state of existence. Where? In Surah Al-Mulk, verse 2. When Allah says, as He defines Himself, who is Allah? الذي خلق الموت والحياة. He says He is the one who created death and life. Here He's confirming that death is not a state of inexistence. So in simpler terms, when you die, you don't vanish. No. Rather, you move from one world to another. How do we know this? The Quran said, خلق الموت. Allah created death. If death was a state of inexistence, there would be no need to create it. You don't need to create what does not exist. Everything in this universe, everything in existence at one point did not exist, except for who? For Allah Ta'ala. A necessary being. So 
So, if death was a form or a state of inexistence, there would there wouldn't be any need to create it. But Allah tells you, I created death. So it's something that exists. It's a being. Hence, those who die or those who died have not vanished. So what happened to them? Where did they go? The answer lies with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi when he says, he says, You were created to remain in existence, not to perish. But what happens, what solely happens is that you are moved from one residence to another. You're moved from one world to another. In simpler terms, you're moved from one building to another building. Right now, you're in building A called Dunya. Tomorrow, when you die, you will move to building B, a building that's more spacious, wider, more beautiful, if you're a believer, and much worse if you're a disbeliever. If you're going to move where? To building B called the Akhirah, the hereafter. So Quran is saying what? Quran is telling you death is not a form of inexistence. It's a form of existence. This message in Surah Al-Mulk comforts the heart. How so? Because when you lose a family member or a dear friend, if you believe that this family member or this friend is still existing. However, there's a barrier between you and him at the moment. He is in one building and you're in a different building. And sooner or later, you're going to go to that building too because everyone's going to die. When you have that belief, you feel comfort because you know that the separation uh, between you and your loved one this separation is a temporary separation, a momentary separation. It's not permanent separation. Whereas, those who believe that death is a form of inexistence, once you die, you're gone. You've vanished. You've perished. Such people, when they lose their family members or their friends, their dear friends, They'll be afflicted with, with a grave form of sadness. They'll be living a very difficult form of misery because they think that's it, they're gone, and will never meet them again. Such a belief, when someone believes that there is no hereafter, once you die, you're gone. You've vanished. Such a belief leads a human being to misery and might even lead him to suicide. God forbid. Whereas believing in the hereafter does the opposite. It comforts you. It tells you, don't worry. They're still around. Yes, you can't see them right now. You can't feel them. But they're in a different world. And sooner or later, you're going to go to them. So the verse الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ, أيكم أحسن عَمَلًا That verse comforts the heart. So number one, Quran tells us what? Death is not a form of inexistence. What else does the Quran say about death? Can it clarify death for, death for us more and more? Yes, it can. And it has. The Quran al Karim told us death is like sleep. Subhanallah. Death in itself is like sleep. But there is a difference between them, obviously. We will realize that based on the Quran and the narrations of Ahlul Bayt, death is a major form of sleep. 
and sleep is a minor form of death. So every day we're dying. When we sleep and we wake up, we're dying. But it's a minor form of death. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reviving us when we wake up. Whereas, when someone dies, he's sleeping, but it's a major form of sleep. He doesn't wake up until when? Until the day of resurrection. Or the day of Raja. If he returns when Sahib Zaman alayhi salam reappears, Ajallah ta'ala for Raja al-Sharif. Where does the Quran say so? Let me send you the verse, and inshallah next week we will analyze it because our time is almost up. In Surah Al Zumar, verse 42, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahu yatawaffa al-anfusa hina mawtiha, wallati lam tamut fi manamiha. Fayumsiku allati qadha alayha al-mawt, wa yursilu al-ukhra ila ajal al-musamma. Inna fi thalika la ayatin liqawmi yatafakkaroon. The translation of Shakir says, Allah takes the souls at the time of their death, and those who have not died in their sleep. So your soul is taken twice. Once you sleep, it's taken. And once you die, it's also taken. The difference is what? Then he retains those for whom he has ordained death, meaning he keeps the soul with him when you die, and releases the others until a specified time. Whereas when you sleep, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't decree that you die in your sleep, what does he do? He returns the soul to the body. There are indeed signs in that for a people who reflect. Next week, inshallah, we'll go in depth with this holy verse and we'll analyze it. Walhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa sallallahu ala al Mustafa Muhammadin, wa alihi al Tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad, wa ajjil farajahum, ya kareem.